Hey, this is Elia Einhorn. Welcome to the Talk House podcast. To celebrate the release of Paul Major's book, Feel the Music, The Psychedelic Worlds of Paul Major, he sat down with Steve Malkmus of Pavement and Stephen Malkmus and the Jicks at the Bowery Ballroom, and they were kind enough to let us record the conversation. The guys take in New York City in the 70s, CBGB, Paul working at a record store owned by the mob and meeting all the artists that he'd been obsessed with. Paul describes himself as an early private press and, quote, real people record collector. For a little bit more on Paul, here's Matt Sweeney. Hello? Hey, what's up, Matt? It's Elia. How's it going, man? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Welcome to the Talk House podcast. Thanks, man. Am I live? Live to recording. Fucking sweet. There we go. Matt, I want to ask you today, you're a guy who's played in Chavez, Zwan, with Iggy Pop. How did you end up playing with Paul Major? Oh, I've known Paul since the mid-90s. My friend Jesper had turned me on to his Feel the Music catalogs, and I met him around then. He put on a show at Webster Hall with this band called The Wild Old Souls, who I, I can't even describe how kind of pure and cool this band was. They definitely weren't of the time. They sort of had a totally earnest Renaissance Fair vibe. Oh, wow. And I remember just being blown away by the band. And then I was kind of checking out the audience and I saw Paul and he is so visually striking that I asked somebody that I was like, who the fuck is that? And they said, oh, that's the guy who makes those catalogs. Can you describe him for our listeners, Matt? You know, he looks... To me, almost like a Mad Magazine version of a like counterculture type. <laughs> he really does. Hair down to his waist. Specifically, Al Jaffe, uh, uh, an Al Jaffe with the bangs and the, the straight shirt. And he's, he's just really, really striking. And he's, he has an incredible vibe about him. But yeah, so I met him around then. And then I think I started playing with him. I was like he would jam in the Chavez rehearsal space. And then I think I just... It, kind of organically. I started jamming with Paul, although I was very intimidated to, because he's one of my favorite guitar players. So it kind of took me a while to, to get up enough to ask to jam. But then, uh, but I mean, I had seen Emma's Boogie about 900 times before uh, I ever played with him. He's a great guitar player. He's also famously a huge collector. Yeah, well, not so much a collector as a conduit, I would say. And, and there, there is a big difference because Paul's never been about, this is mine. He's always been like, you got to hear this. Yeah, he's a turn-on dude, you know. I mean, he's not going to go up to you and tell you what, what to listen to. But if you should ask, uh, he will blow your mind. He's really charismatic in that regard. He's very charismatic. But, but I wanted to ask you this. Aside from that charisma, what is it that draws people to Paul? We had in the audience, and your work from the Smiths was hanging out. It was sort of a creme de la creme of musicians in New York. And, of course, we had Steve Malkmus interviewing mm-hmm. him. What is it that draws musicians to him? I mean, he's just so clearly a musical spirit, you know? I mean, I know him because I care about marginal rock music and you know and so musicians are drawn to him because musicians spend too much time thinking about records and music (laughs) and stuff and it's funny that paul doesn't have a web presence even at this point uh you know uh it's incredibly frustrating that he didn't get to you know what's the word that pigs use monetize he didn't get to monetize um yes on any other day with you know if he had he not stopped for a sandwich on a certain day i feel like he he could have you know what i mean Mm -hmm. he's so effortlessly and gently evangelical about music you know and and again the reason that people started talking about him were these you know three sentence reviews that he wrote that remain the best writing about music that i've ever read which is what that book interview thing that Stephen did was about. That was for Feel the Music, the Psychedelic Worlds of Paul Major. Yes. And, uh, you know, that book's really important and everybody should check it out. And there's not one single band that you've ever heard of in there. And the idea is that that's okay. You know, in, in fact, that's great. In fact, that's the way that it's supposed to be. Come on in, the water's fine. Paul does not pride himself on being an expert, nor does he lord uh, information over you. He's the last guy to ever say what you don't know. He's, it's, it's all about sharing, and he is just as excited to hear something that he hasn't heard. He's easily the least judgmental person I've ever met. 
mm. and he's wide open. And, you know, if you think of the book, it's the same thing as picking up the, his catalogs, you know, back then. I, I had never, I didn't know what the fuck he was, any of these bands were, you know. I just read these, these descriptions <laughs> and it set my mind on fire and his descriptions were so pure. Uh, he could describe how something sounds and how something feels, you know, better than anybody I know. Uh, when it comes to scuzzball and 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 weirdo guitar rock, a fucking men, Matt Sweeney, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Everybody who finds out about Paul is so fucking happy about it. You know, I'm glad you're doing this. It's great. Let's roll the tape. Doctor Paul Major, Doctor Steve Malkmus. <laughs> All righty. Um, so the book, it's um. Everyone here probably knows that it is a sort of encapsulation of your life's in music. Uh, it's almost like a scrapbook from the time the mentors you had when you were a record collect getting started through your life, not only as a record discoverer and trader, but a musician living in in New York and up almost to endless boogie times. And it's, it's amazing. And it also has the kind of handmade feel of um, a lot of the records that you admire, which is cool. But what we're gonna talk about now is uh, your perspective. I think a good way to start is kind of chronologically, as it says, it's the psychedelic world of Paul Major. Um, I was interested in you know, it started in some psychedelic place. What it came to is records that are psychedelic in a different way than sometimes than like traditional flowers and and uh, wah wah petals. Although they do exist. So, what was it like? Your music. Uh, what music first led you on your Quest. It happened, I had just turned 12 years old at the end of 1966. I was a math nerd, a science nerd, you know, and Mad Magazine too, and, and monster movies and UFOs. But uh, on the radio, I heard Psychotic Reaction by the Count Five. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I was not myself anymore. I was somebody else. And that got me started. It's like, I have to find more of this and hear more of this. It was a good time to come in because it was when music was early on, all these psychedelic elements were coming into it and it's like music leaking from another dimension. You know, it, it was like, you know, the unprecedented things that was happening then. So it made me feel like a flying saucer to actually come down and, you know, they were you know, taking me away from uh, my isolated life in Louisville, you know, no more bullies chasing me and punching me and stuff like that. You know, now ooh, I got a world to escape into. At that point then, yeah, I used to mow lawns to get money and every money I would get Saturday, I'd go first to the chain stores because it was a, a good timing where when records came out a few months later and they bombed because they were the obscure groups that the major labels were putting out because the doors were famous or whatever. So let's get all the groups we can find that sound like that. It would come out. So, you know, my interest was uh, even from day one, I went looking for records, not looking for a record I was looking for, but looking for records that it, uh, I didn't know what they were. And I'd scrutinize the covers and look for clues. And this dovetails with uh, being a kid, you know, about the same time there was a famous... Uh, article in Life magazine about LSD. And there was a picture in there of this guy sitting in a corner, you know, and the caption was something like, this guy thinks he's an orange. And, and, and so I, I was thinking to myself, oh man, I want to be an orange too. And, and I, um, you know, I had no access to substances or anything for another four years, you know, when finally I met some, you know, high school freaks and, and stuff. So I had to get that experience, you know, from those records, you know, I'd be examining ultimate spinach or whatever, like, ooh, long track called Mind Flowers. This might be what tripping is like, you know. And, 
I'd have these fantasies. Uh, I'd listen to them and lay on my bed, and I'd imagine I was down, shrunk down to the size where I could walk in the grooves like they're big canyons, you know, and... and uh, I started just buying all the strange records. It was a great time, you know. I was out of the gate. I, I was getting Velvet Underground records and all the and all the Detroit bands and stuff like like this. And uh, you know, it, it just popped in my head a minute ago talking to Steve that actually before I actually got my hands on acid or anything like that, I realized I did have a, a psychedelic experience with with music where I dozed off on my bed as a kid, and I woke up in the middle of Expecting to Fly, the Buffalo Springfield song. So I'm waking up, and you know how that song sounds ethereal and airy, so it's like, whoa, yeah, yeah I'm in La La Land for sure. And uh, it went on that way, yeah, I was obsessed. The other thing was I had to have a guitar too, you know, and, and so magically my pam family had no money at the time because my father had had a truck wreck and, and stuff, but under the Christmas tree is a plastic toy guitar. When I'm 13, I'm, ooh, yeah. So I take my crayons and I color it all psychedelic. And then I'm playing it, and I was like, wow, this thing isn't, you know, it, it, you know, it sounds like a ukulele or whatever. And, and then I had the idea, oh, wait, if I tape a pencil under the bridge, it'll make the strings buzz. So, so I made, you know, fuzz tone with a pencil. So it'd be like, and stuff, and started playing along with my records. And uh, it went on like that. Basically, my, my life, except for a couple of, you know, friends and stuff for years, was I was escaping the harsh reality of Louisville, Kentucky uh, through the records, you know. It's just, it's just got in my blood. <laughs> yeah. So that takes you through to this, we call this the post-acid phase um, or, or pre-college and, right, living yeah, in Louisville. Yeah, pre-college, yeah, yeah. I did meet some like-minded uh, friends towards the end of high school when I was 16. You know, I had my first girlfriend and things like that. And in Kentucky, all the stuff that was happening on the coast came a few years later or something. But finally, you know, met some friends, but, you know, and we would have parties in, in one guy's basement who had parents that were like, but I don't want to say cool, who were daft enough they didn't know what, what was going on in the basement. <laughs> so so uh, the rule was... Everybody gets to bring over an album and at the party, play the album and the whole album must play. So, you know, there's like uh, Jethro Tull and Yes <laughs> or whatever <laughs> from them. And then I'd be, you know, it'd be Kick Out the Jams or, or White Light, White Heat or something like that. And they'd just be like, oh, you know, can we change these rules? <laughs> 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 or something. So it sort of went like that until I went to St. Louis then to college in uh, 1972. And um, at that point, I was not with the obscure records thing or something, but I was meeting other people that were into stuff that I liked. And of course, then that was the heyday of, of psychedelic drugs and stuff in the, in the Midwest and that. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden people weren't bummed out when I put the Morgan album on or something. They say, oh, that, you know, that's, you know, that sounds almost as good as Alice Cooper Killer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so let's move a bit on to record collecting and how the genres that you basically define, in my mind, independent private presses and, you know, real people, um, music. When did you start to get a feel, like obviously you like the MC5 and, and uh, the uh, Detroit major label bands that are right. outside in their own right, but like when did you think, oh, I can find, how did you have the urge to be a collector of this, these records? Was that in New York? Uh, it, 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 yeah, it sort of started uh, previous to coming to New York, I, I was still maintaining my, my thing and going into record store. And so I was looking for, you know, more obscure bands that might sound like those bands was basically the thing. Still looking. Uh, and I didn't really distinguish, oh, this is some small label or some band that put it out themselves for a while, although I had accumulated some of those, like the ones from around Kentucky and so forth. And uh, the flashpoint was in the fall of 1977 in St. Louis. It had a 
sort of a pre-punk sort of weird band called the Moldy Dogs. And we decided uh, after putting on a punk rock festival there in January 77 that we had to go to New York or L.A. and, uh, you know, and, you know, do, do punk rock. So we went to L.A. because the weather was conducive then and realized we made a mistake. It was too early going to L.A. But I did get some exposure to collector stores there and, and found some, uh, you know, strange records like... Uh, there used to be a chain store called Peaches that was big down the south. And they had a store at, um, on Hollywood Boulevard. And in the bins outside were, were three bins full of Yehoa 13 albums for 44 cents. So I'm thinking, well, this looks like my kind of stuff. Of course, I wasn't uh, you know, smart enough to buy more than one each because I had no idea anybody else cared about these records. And you know, that's why they're 44 cents. Nobody likes them. <laughs> but... Uh, I had a little glimmering, but then in the fall of 77 in uh, Far Hills, New Jersey, a friend, there was another band from St. Louis uh, who had moved up here and changed the name and, and founded the band called The Sick Fucks, which were a famous CBGB band in, in, in the day. And they had a free house we could live in because one of the guy's fathers worked for a bank and they had repossessed it. So... We were living in this house. We had a little recording studio in the basement, and we put an ad in a local paper called The Aquarian for the studio. And one day in the mail comes this package with three copies of the Kenneth Higney Attic Demonstration record. And uh, when I played that record, I had the flash moment, wait, this is a real person. I'm getting inside a real per person's life, you know. He's doing the most brilliant things, like sideways, like he's trying to make country demos and, and break in, you know, I think he was trying to get, uh, now I can't remember, Waylon Jennings or somebody to do one of his songs and so forth. And, and the record went so brilliantly wrong and, and was so honest to him and, and in his mind, I felt like I was getting inside his head. And my focus shifted then. That's where the real people thing came where all of a sudden, you know, like when I was a younger kid, it was like, uh, all these bands, you know, and stuff, they seemed like big and godlike. I had no conception, you know, that, you know, they're just like me, you know, same amount of time on the toilet during their life, the whole deal. And, uh, <laughs> And with Higney, then I, it shifted my focus. And, you know, through him, I realized, wait, all these people, the famous ones, everybody else, well, they're all real people, you know? And I felt like, I, oh, I can get in their shoes. And with Higney and Peter Grizzian and, and people like that, then it, it became, uh, you know, the potency came from these were are people on the margins trying to do their thing, really striving back in those days when you had to make an effort to get a record out. It was almost out of your control. You, know, you had to be, really be driven. And um, I just realized, wait a minute, you know, nobody's tampering with this guy's existence. I'm getting the real guy here, so. Yeah, and again, you're touching like on an interesting thing about um, your uh, interest in it, I mean, there was the object of the record itself, which is a record collector thing, and you have some of that in you. Like you t say when you were a kid, you're looking at the records and the, and the thing, and it has a, a feel like beyond just the sound. But the people you cared about just as much, obviously, and I want to talk a little bit, I mean, that's you were visiting, once you got into this, you would go to meet these artists, find the records, and you were in, in between this other side of the collectors, some of which are addicts, weird, <laughs> obsessive record collectors. Yeah. And you're, you're not like, you're somewhere uh, like a, you're not like that, you know? I just, you know, Paul doesn't own any of these records anymore. He was always passing them on. Yeah. And it was kind of the existing in the, in the enthusiasm and the turning on to other people, um, this music. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always there. So I, I think that's a special thing about you. And, and because I've been there in the I Have This, or you told me that story about the German collector who... Uh, you can, you can tell. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's, 
when I realized really that it were other people. And it was still, uh, it's not like I lost my interest in psychedelic records and garage records and all that. It's just like the more homemade, more unusual things in, intrigue me more. But uh, not too long after then, yeah, I, re I realized I was a channel and, and I, anything I had would be sacrificed to get something I hadn't had yet. And to me, it's like, not like I had to, you know, butterfly collect and keep them as long as, you know, they pass through my hands and, and I realized, oh, if I ever need to hear that again, I can. Uh, yeah, I, I lost that. Early on, with the, I was obsessed with the physical object for sure, that down, yeah, down to delusions of uh, favorite 45s when I was a kid, you know, the color of the label actually would influence me. And I made this flash like, oh, wait a minute, that yellow label on Sunshine of Your Love would be all wrong if it was on Crazy World of Arthur Brown Fire, which was red. And uh, I went down all these pathways, you know, and sort of got over, over that in a way, although still get kind of irked sometimes. I want to see the original label when I'm listening to a re reissue and not, not, look at, <laughs> it, uh, not, not look at somebody's, you know, la later... Uh, you know, perversion of it. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I did start, I was obsessed. And I, I could say like one of my, you know, weird obsessions, I, I had a fantasy early on when I was first, you know, getting those records and the elevators and all this stuff when I was a kid. I had this idea, oh, when I die, I'm going to get a big plasticine cough and make clear and I, I'm going to have all my favorite album covers in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, I don't know, later, I became a channel. I got totally <laughs> over it and uh you know I, I was a kid in a candy store then too because people weren't there were very few people looking for these records a guy here a guy there around the world a, a secretive network like a secret society you know people that would call you up in the middle of the night and say you won't believe this and play it and then they wouldn't tell you what it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah your phone bills must have been high sometimes yeah when really, i was yeah. reading yeah the one time you talked to somebody and Sweden maybe all night. Uh, he, 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 yeah, he, yeah. he was wondering how high that bill was. I want to know. You don't remember, I'm sure. They were, they were huge, yeah. You know, $500,000 phone. That's another bills. thing of the... But, th but that's <laughs> when I could walk into a store and look in the 25 cent, cent section and find a $1,000 album, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, so discovering some, I mean, some of your favorite artists, I don't know if we could talk about some of the people you you met not only the records that you found but I, you know some of the artists that you hung out with and and had moments with and yeah there were, there were a number of mysterious ones uh, you know some some were just uh, uh situations where I finally found the guy and you know, he, you know he figured I was either a friend playing a joke on him or, or a bill collector or whatever yeah, they, they couldn't believe because he was so unsuccessful with his music uh, <laughs> that that uh, <laughs> that they figured yeah, yeah, he, he couldn't really like my my music. Nobody else did. Even even my mother hated it, you know. Or <laughs> something. But, but um, in an inter interesting way, when I met Kenneth Higney, he turned out to be like I was expecting. This guy is going to be ooh, yeah, <laughs> way out, out there. there, and he was a very down to earth, nice, you know, mild mannered just nice guy and that this serendipitous thing happened to that, 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 uh, that, uh, that, that, you know, his attempt at country demos became like pioneering art <laughs> or something. But I think of all the people that I met, my favorite is a uh, person and the person who, who was a converse of Kenneth Higney, who was even further out than I even could imagine was Peter Gritzian. And, uh, I could probably, you know, go on with a hundred Twilight Zone anecdotes about him. You know, some of them are funny. He's the nicest guy in the world. And, you know, he didn't quite get that people uh, heard his music as being, like, innovative and strange or whatever. He, he's another guy. Basically, he was trying to break into country music and... Uh, you know, somehow he started using chopped up choral sections and <laughs> and music concrete in his country songs and uh, <laughs> and uh, I guess this is back in the days too, way back before what with uh, the plug-in in the world and everything, where everything is melding together and leaking and you, you know how it is now. It's like you hear 
Almost anything you hear, you, it makes you think of something else. You, you don't hear, hardly ever hear anything that seems unprecedented. And that's the way it seemed to me in the 60s, like the first time I heard, are you experienced or something like that? Wait, this did not exist before. And, you know, can that happen? And I think with people like Peter Gridzi and uh, I had that experience too. And there's just so many stories about him. There's a couple in the book. Um, we tried to film him once uh, with a friend, Stefan Curie was over from Sweden. He had a film crew even with the makeup artists and lights and the whole thing. And you know, Peter's like, yeah, yeah, you can come over to my house and make a movie. And he, he lived in Astoria, Queens, little row houses. We're walking down the street at Park, the found parking, walking down the street. Every house has a perfect little manicured lawn with a few flowers. And then, the, then there's the Munster you know, house. <laughs> all overgrown, you know, like the gates, you know, broken off, you know, and everything. So he said, well, well, we don't have to look at the number. That's his house. <laughs> and then we went uh, up there and rang the doorbell. And he had lived there ever since he was a kid. And uh, his father was still alive and living in the house as well. And uh, ringing the doorbell, it's like, hey, Peter, we're here. You know, here's the film crew and all this stuff. And he's like, oh, you know you can't bring that stuff in here, you know. He, said, he says that, you know, uh, this, these guys from Con Ed, the electrical utility, he said, hey, came over yesterday and punched my father in the face and stole his shoes. So no electrical people are allowed in the house. <laughs> <laughs> There's so, no power in the house or just no electrical people? No allowed? electrical people, yeah. you know. <laughs> Which, you know, people with cameras and lights and There's stuff pictures. were electrical people. There's pictures <laughs> in, the, in the book of the, the session. The visit, without, yeah. yeah. We took a little, you know, snapshot camera in there and took some pictures, and it, it's astonishing. Uh, and his whole story is astonishing. I used to, when I had a record label and I was trying to do, working with some, like, current, then current mid-90s bands and stuff like that, and they'd be playing Coney Island High or somewhere and bring Peter around, and all, all the... Everybody's just intrigued. They cannot believe, you know, talking to him because he could talk your ear off about any topic in the world and, and some key element would be wrong that makes the whole thing, <laughs> whole, whole thing brilliant. Like, you know, hearing him talk about car mechanics was you know, yeah. just unbelievable. And, and uh, so I really got into, into him. I thought, yeah, this is, you know, this is like... Uh, Somebody said, yeah, it, it truly is the hillbilly from the Twilight Zone, you know, and, and <laughs> the real deal, you know, you know, utterly genuine, you know. He's a guy, and there's lots of other guys I have stories about and, and things like that, but he's a guy that went on for years. Another quick one actually was, was um, then my partner in the label, Alan Road and Mike Ashman, we had a studio where we're going to take Peter's tapes to reissue the Unicorn album. And it was a high-end, like, audiophile studio. And Peter's tapes, they were spliced every 10 seconds and falling apart, you know. And, and the guy saying, this is the wor these are the worst tapes I've ever worked on. You know, Peter's getting uptight, you know. And they said, you know, the way this is mixed, uh, whoever, you know, recorded this ha has impaired hearing in one ear, you know. And then <laughs> and Peter, you know, Peter says, yeah, but it doesn't affect my hearing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, all this funny stuff, you know, Peter's getting uptight and this and that, and, you know, he's, there's a little tension with him and the recording engineer and stuff. And I remember Peter jumps up, he has headphones and he jumps up, the headphones like plump out and he runs outside and, and he comes back in and he said one of the funny, you know, one of, one of the many funny Peter Gridzian lines. Then he comes back in and this was when Bush was president, George, uh, uh, younger Bush. And, uh, then he says to the recording engineer, uh, as we're leaving, and it's all, all done, he says, you know, you look a lot like George Bush. And, and the recording engineer goes, uh, looks a little nonplussed. And then, then Peter goes, oh, oh, no, he's a very attractive man. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one more. I don't know. We could go on forever. Your stories are amazing. You killed you, it. Um, the uh, I I think maybe we could talk. I, we started a little bit about a lost New York, uh, your personal life, and and living here. And 
I always think it's interesting to hear about the 70s and 80s and how you managed. I mean, you, this was your job. It would be impossible to do now, I would imagine, in this, not only because the records have dried up, and, yeah. and um, but uh, maybe a little talk about old New York, like the, New York, the, yeah. the 70s yeah. and working at Village Oldies and right. I don't know. Yeah, it's intriguing that's a, another thing that could be a whole book. Uh, just I was at Village Oldies. I came here in January '78, and it was a block away on the corner of Bleecker and Sullivan uh, from where my apartment was. And coming to New York, I remember some people saying, "Oh, New York's rough. It's going to eat you up," you know. And then when you come here, and we get a, it's a five floor walk up. But me and my friend Wolf and the band get an apartment, uh, only you know, two bedrooms and a kitchen in the middle. Thing, but it's $198 a month. So then I'm thinking, wait, wait, I'm in New York City and I only have to come up with $99 a month. You know? But I'm thinking, well, you know, wow, I don't need to work, uh, you know, or something. I could just go to one record store and buy a few records and take them to another store and then my rent's paid. <laughs> but, but, but I did get a job and it was Village Oldies, which is, uh, has a long history. Uh, started in the psychedelic 60s. It was a little further to, to the east on Bleecker Street at that time. And it was uh, Bleecker Bob and Broadway Al were the partners in the store. And Broadway Al was, was sort of considered the pioneer, like the first guy to go up to Harlem back, you know, in the late 50s, early 60s, and, and looking for rhythm and blues and doo-wop and all these private pressings of that kind of thing. And so, you know, that sort of his genesis to start this store and... It was definitely famous in the, you know, in the swinging 60s. Like Frank Zappa worked there when the mothers were in town for that run at the Garrick Theater and, and Patti Smith and Lenny Kay met there and stuff like that. But when I got there, the glory days were over. Half of the shop was a head shop run by junkies. There was just crazy stuff going on, on all the time there. You know, records did get sort of, sort of sold. You know, there were all kinds of strange customers that come in, but it was mainly a place to blast punk rock and, and, and party all day until, you know, or whatever. It, it definitely wasn't, uh, it was the kind of job you want to go to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. So that went on for a while and, uh, and, uh, two bucks an hour and, and all the beer you could drink, yeah, basically, because <laughs> yeah, Broadway Al had, there's a refrigerator, there's a Actually, I, I was astonished that for the book, they found a picture of the, the refrigerator where, where Broadway all kept his beer. And, uh, and he'd always complain, you know, yeah, you guys are drinking all my beer, you know. And they, they say, well, yeah, it cost me nine cents a bottle at the wholesalers, you know. Like, <laughs> but, you know, $2 an hour, I guess, you know, I guess. Yeah, the economy was very different then. And Bleecker Street, it was tr truly nuts, you know, then. It was actually... Uh, was run, definitely controlled by the various five families, the mob and so forth. And uh, their, their law was sort of equal to the police. And the police at that time did not care about drinking on the street or anything. And uh, you would just see, see crazy stuff. There, uh, and there were some pinball machines in the back. And one day... Uh, an inspector comes in and says, oh, the, these machines are, you know, these are illegal, you know, or something. And so, you, you know, fill this out. You give us your name and all that stuff. And so I did that and I forgot about it, you know, whatever. And then, then some weeks later, I, I, I come home uh, from being out somewhere a long time and there's this thing plastered on my door, you know, you've failed to appear in criminal court. A warrant will be issued for your arrest. <laughs> If you, yeah, and so forth, and, you know, I'm freaking out, and then, then you know, then I real, oh, realize, oh, wait, you know, those pinball machines, but uh, turns out the, the pinball machines were owned by the Genovese family, and uh, so Broadway Al just says, oh, oh, you know, don't worry about it, you know, just go over and see the chin of uh, Vincent Chigani over at the Triangle Club, you know, and he'll write you a check, you know, and so I went over, and... and into in, into the club there, and then and he, and he writes a check, and he says, "Oh, you know, if they, you know, kid, why'd you give him your real name?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, "Oh, that guy won't be back. It was a new inspector. We, we you know, we'll get him reassigned. The old guy's coming back <laughs> or something." 
So, so I had to go to, it, it got pretty brutal after a while. I had, had to leave. It started, started, you know, scary stuff started happening. And, uh, you know, the, the junkies were getting out of control and, you know, threatened to shoot each other and stuff like that. And, and um, you, were in a, you were in a band too during this time, you guys, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. When it first came, I had a band uh, called The Tears that was really the Moldy Dogs. Uh, and we had some good early shows playing like with the Corpse Grinders and CBGBs and the Stimulators and a bunch of bands. And it went on for a while, but the band was going in a more power pop direction. I was going in a, in a more hard noise direction. I think one of the key things that put me that way uh, was one time we played on a bill with Red Transistor, which was this guy named Von Elmo's band. And it was just wall of sound, insane you know, noise. And all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, I got to do, you know, something crazier. So I founded a band with a guy named Dave called the Sorcerers. And we were huge motorhead freaks and Hawkwind freaks and that. So we would do Hawkwind songs, motorhead style and, <laughs> and, and, and write stuff. And, um, we had a pretty good time. We played at Max's a bunch of the time, you know, the, the, the Peter Crowley, the guy that booked Max's really liked the band. So, you know, whenever a new Motorhead single came out in England, you know, Dave from the Sources would have it right away and it'd go right in the Max's jukebox. And so there, at some point there were about half a dozen or eight Motorhead singles in there and we'd you know, be there every other night. And then we'd just play Motorhead singles for hours and put our beers on the jukebox and people would get really bummed. <laughs> but but, but we, had, we had incredible times with the Sources. There's another thing when I think of this, you know, some of the stories and mischief, you know, got into when you're a young kid. Uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. I was thinking, too, yeah, there used to be this guy named Billy Gallagher who was uh, one of those, like, collect debts, leg-breaking guys for, for, the, for the mob. And he used to come in there all the time because his sister was married to the, the junkie that ran the head shop or something. And, uh, and I'm thinking, that, yeah, Dave from the Sorcerers and Al, who had started the label with... Not Broadway Al, but Audio Al, another <laughs> friend of mine. <laughs> Started a label with, I remember both of them, like uh, Gallagher had put both of them in the hospital, you know, because he felt they were slighting him or something. He beat them up with hubcaps in the store, you know. And I was always, you know, I could always handle him, you know. I was thinking, okay, this guy's, you know, he's on a tripwire. The only thing you have to do is just, you know, not have him get it into his head the idea that, you know, you think you're better than him. <laughs> and uh, I did pretty good at that. Even the, the night he came in and, and, and demanded to hear a Magical Mystery Tour like 25 times in a row. <laughs> and he would come in and plop piles of pills on the counter and say, here, take some of these. <laughs> and, and so, of course, you know, me being, you know, having some sense of self-preservation, I like act like I was taking them. <laughs> uh, um. Oh, as an aside, too, with the junkie thing, you know, it turns out, like, one of the key events that happened in my life uh, happened when I was three years old in Kentucky. A dog bit me and ran away, so I had to have rabies shots in my belly when I was three years old, and... It gave me a lifelong fear of needles. So there was no, you know, yeah, people, yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm thinking too, I'm hanging out with some people like the, you know, my idols, like Johnny Thunders and people like that. And he's, you know, so you want to, you know, you do something together and stuff. And it's like, fortunately, I, you know, I could not do needles. And when I had left New York and came back in the early 90s and I started asking around what happened to little Billy, what happened to Donna, what happened to Amy, all these people in that sort of circle, Almost all of them were dead. <laughs> yeah, so. and, and it was dirty needles or overdoses. So, so I just think, you know, your life can, it's weird, you know. You, who would think a dog biting you, you know, in 1957 would save your life? Would save your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice message to, uh, um, yeah. I want to thank, uh, we all want to thank you for amazing stories. And the book is like, it's you. I, you'll hear his voice now when you uh, read it and Paul's voice. And it's, it's just uh, really special. Well, thanks, Steve. 
thanks to Danielle De Palma for working live sound at the Bowery Ballroom. And thanks to our engineer and co-producer, Mark Yoshizumi. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you check out Steve Malkmus's conversation with Emo Amos. You can catch TalkHouse on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We also have a new YouTube channel and are running some full episodes on there. To our regular listeners, head over to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Every time you do, it helps someone else find the podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.